Episode 1 of Ahsoka sets up the premise with much exposition, for it's been a while since fans were presented with a Star Wars show that departs from the original lore. A ship of the New Republic is moving through space when the crew picks up an unknown ship that's using a Jedi code. When the captain allows the unknown ship to board, two hooded figures emerge, and they're none other than Balin Kroll and his apprentice, Shin Hadi. The mysterious arrivals unsheath lightsabers and slice through the crew on board before rescuing Morgan Elsbeth. Those who've stuck around since the Mandalorian remember how Ahsoka defeated Morgan and arrested her. The ship was supposed to deliver Morgan to face trial, but before long, the crew is decimated, and the convict is freed, whose first concern is retrieving the map that shall lead her to Admiral Thrawn. However, she's not alone in the pursuit, and her arch-rival Ahsoka Tano also has the same goal. We meet our heroine, Ahsoka, as she strolls through a deserted, sandy patch with large obelisks forming a weird circle. With a swift spin with her dual lightsabers, Ahsoka slashes the ground, descends into the underground, and follows a set of puzzles to unearth a carved sphere. This little ball contains details about her nemesis Thrawn's location, but Ahsoka barely gets time to catch her breath as she's surrounded by droids outside the underground chamber. A Jedi trained by none other than Anakin Skywalker, Ahsoka slices through the machines with ease and leaps onto the ship driven by her trusted droid, Huyang, as the hostile droids self-destruct. Ahsoka meets up with Hera Syndulla, the pilot of the ghost ship and an invaluable member of the Lothal Rebellion, and shares the contents of the map she's just retrieved. Inside the map are details about Thrawn, although Hera finds it odd that the Admiral might still be breathing. This is also where Ezra is mentioned, and for context, we change scenes to Lothal. While the citizens of Lothal gather to commemorate the memories of the crew of Ghost, especially Ezra Bridger, believed to have been killed in the Battle of Lothal, Sabine Wren is missing. Sabine, an important member of the crew, is racing in her speeder to her small home, where she plays a recording of Ezra, someone she'd come to see as her brother. Ahsoka's arrival changes the mood, as she announces that there's a chance Ezra might be alive, but to get to him, Ahsoka needs her former apprentice's help. However, tensions run high between the two women until Huyang comes bearing important news. Having analyzed the lightsabers used in the New Republic ship, the droid concludes that one of the weapons belongs to Balin Skull, a skilled Jedi who fell out of the loop after the Clone Wars ended. Ahsoka hands Sabine the map and implores her to solve the puzzle so that they can head for Thrawn, and by extension, Ezra's location, at the earliest. But when has a direct order by a superior that's been given with a lot of thought ever been followed by their less experienced and immature counterpart? Of course, Sabine takes off with the map and heads to her home in the middle of nowhere, away from the safety of the Imperial building. Using her brilliance, Sabine discovers the correct way to open the sphere, which gives a 3D image of entire galaxies with clues as to where Thrawn might be located. Like clockwork, she's ambushed by two droids, and while she manages to finish one, the other steals the map and ensures to destroy every machine in Sabine's workplace to remove every record. By the time Sabine catches up to the thieving droid, she's faced with Shin Hattie, standing with her own lightsaber. Armed with her brother Ezra's lightsaber, Sabine faces off against the intruder who stands between her and the quest of seeking out her brother. A fight ensues, and Shin quickly begins gaining on the former apprentice of Ahsoka Tano, who's heading towards the scene of the duel. However, she's a little too late, and Shin drives her red laser through Sabine's gut before fleeing with the map as the ghost member collapses on the ground. The map with details about Thrawn's whereabouts was stolen by Skull's apprentice, Shin, and she'll now be heading back to her master and Morgan with the newly discovered piece of the puzzle. Sabine lies on a bed in the medical wing of Lot Hal as Ahsoka Tano and Hera hover over her while the nurse droids try treating her. Upset that she failed to decipher the data that the map held before the enemy droids stole it, Sabine has a hard time looking her former master Ahsoka in the eyes. Not only has the map, the only way to track Admiral Thrawn as well as Ezra Bridger, fallen into enemy hands, but the droids have also destroyed any of the remaining equipment in Sabine's home, making it impossible for them to retrace the clues she'd found from the map. Ahsoka heads back to the place where the droids stole the map and meets Sabine's loath cat, which mews nervously. Moments later, the creature shrieks as a previously hidden droid launches a surprise attack on Ahsoka. However, the surprise is futile, and she barely flinches while decapitating the machine and proceeds to bring back the severed head to Sabine. This is a field the former ghost crew excels at, and she's quickly able to hack the droid circuits because they're still connected to their source, even if they're killed. However, if the procedure isn't finished quickly, a certain meter on the head might reach the tipping point, resulting in a catastrophic explosion. As the droid Huyang starts panicking with the growing meter pointing the way to impending destruction, Sabine asks for more time. With mere seconds left before the entire area is blown to bits, 
Hu Yan disconnects the droid as Sabine declares triumphantly that the droids have arrived from a shipyard registered under the New Republic. This discovery is a bit confusing because, after the fall of the Empire, it's believed that every New Republic member gave up pursuing evil across the galaxy. However, Ahsoka isn't satisfied, and she takes Hera with her to check out the said shipyard, although she refuses to take Sabine with her, much to the latter's chagrin. Ahsoka leaves with the typical, you've done enough, a dual-edged verbal sword that pierces Sabine, still smarting because she'd refused to listen to Ahsoka in the previous episode. Even though she's just helped them find an important clue by taking a massive risk, she can't help but feel that they wouldn't be in this mess if it weren't for her stubbornness. Moreover, her stomach wound hasn't healed yet, so she lacks the confidence to follow her former teacher into trouble. However, for now, Sabine only has herself to blame. When Hera and Ahsoka reach the shipyard, there's palpable tension, as the surveyor of the area looks rather uncomfortable with a Jedi poking around. When the women go into the main office and start inquiring about the shipments in the last few days, the crew is completely silent, except for a few furtive glances at the new arrivals. A service droid mistakenly mentions that an HK assassin droid has been spotted very recently, and it had a high security clearance, so it couldn't be logged. What's more, the assassin is leaving the shipyard at that very moment in a ship, and despite Hera's repeated orders to shut the droid down, the crew refuses to comply. Realizing that the inspecting women might expose their secrets, the crew members launch an attack on them, but Hera and Ahsoka quickly put them down. Ahsoka leaps down the window and is faced with an Inquisitor and his droid, and the enemies put up a tough fight. Meanwhile, Hera gets on her trusted ship and begins chasing the vessel that's escaping the shipyard, which now begins shooting at the pursuing Hera. Although Ahsoka is able to decimate the droid with her lightsaber skills, the Inquisitor is a tougher opponent. Before the Tigruta warrior can do any effective damage to the new Empire loyalist, a ship comes to his rescue, and Shin steps out to help him up. He uses force to get his lightsaber back, indicating that the loyalist possesses force powers, making him a formidable opponent. On the other side of things, Hera is giving a tough chase to the escaping vessel while communicating with her droid chopper to find a tracker. Just as the fleeing ship nears the warp point, Hera is able to eject a tracker onto the ship, thereby ensuring they can now track the ship no matter where it flees to. Back at the shipyard, the loyalists, including the supervisor, are arrested, and Ahsoka explains that it's just greed that makes people sell their dignity to the Empire. Back in Lot Hal, Sabine stares into the distance after having a rather thought-provoking talk with the droid Huyang. Uncharacteristic of the droid, Huyang provides intriguing things for her to ponder, the basis of which is that one has to forge their own path instead of waiting for handouts. Sabine had spent years hoping that Ahsoka would take her on as her apprentice, but it was time that she took control of her life. She goes back to her little home and unearths her old Mandalorian gear. When Ahsoka returns to Lot Hal, Sabine meets her in full Mandalorian gear with smartly trimmed short hair. Before boarding Ahsoka's ship, she touches the picture of Ezra drawn on the wall, thus indicating the strength of her bond with the brother she hopes is still alive. The sweetest portion is probably when Ahsoka refers to Sabine as Padawan, showing she's accepted the youngster as her trainee once more, hopefully for good this time. However, the enemies aren't sitting idle while the good guys sift through clues. Balin Skull and Shin bring the map to Morgan Elsbeth as she stands in a mystical place and uncovers the map's ability to explore the galaxy where Thrawn is. She can hear her master's voice and tell Skull that he's calling to her. Skull responds to Shin by saying that if the plan works, they will know power like they've never known it before. Later, as Ahsoka speeds through space to reach the enemies, Morgan asks Skull if he can sense the oncoming Jedi. Although Ahsoka has masked her movements as a skilled Jedi, he can still sense her determination reverberating, and Morgan suggests killing her. Skull, however, isn't very pleased with the prospect, and he reasons that not too many Jedi survive at present. This isn't him being sentimental, however, but just being truthful. The last time Morgan faced Ahsoka, she had a Besker spear, and yet she was defeated by Ahsoka's lightsabers and sent to prison. There's no guarantee that the next time Ahsoka meets her, she won't uproot the problem by ending Morgan's life for good. Besides, Ahsoka's survival means Thrawn will always have someone gunning for him. So in every way, Ahsoka is bad news for Morgan, and she can't wait to get rid of the nuisance. This can be chalked up to her being a weaker fighter than the protagonist and also because the Empire is on its last legs at the moment and won't be able to survive a head-on attack. The Republic can be greatly harmed if a soldier like Ahsoka can be taken out, so Morgan is definitely better off with her death. What happens to her plans, though? We'll know in the next episode. Ahsoka walks into one of the rooms inside the ship they're traveling in to find Sabine training with the human-turned droid, Huyang. 
The Jedi takes the lead and asks Sabine to put on a visor that blocks her vision completely, as Ahsoka plans to train her in the Zatochi method. Relying just on her peripheral senses, the Mandalorian Sabine needs to detect any incoming attacks from her master, but her temper and frustration over her recent failures make her impatient. Ahsoka quickly lays Sabine out on her back and then corrects Huyang's assumption that Sabine can't use the Force. Ahsoka reminds them that all living beings can channel the Force, and it's up to the user to hone it to the level of a Jedi. Leaving Sabine to try awakening her Jedi abilities, Ahsoka mentions to Huyang that she doesn't expect her Padawan to become a Jedi but only hopes that Sabine can just be herself. Meanwhile, in the New Republic Senate, Hera arrives with hopes of asking for backup so that she can go after Admiral Thrawn. The initial conversation with Chancellor Mon Mothma is pleasant, but when Hera mentions her target, a low murmur begins in the Senate. Senator Ziorno offers the harshest criticism of Hera's pleas for support, firmly adamant that Thrawn is dead and also questioning the real intentions of Hera's plans. The pilot retorts that the senator knows nothing of wars and hence shouldn't interject when matters of war are being discussed, but despite her best efforts, the pleas for backup are rejected by the Senate. The Star Wars lore is never complete without politics, in fact, it forms a central part of the whole saga. Hence, it's not surprising that the ones in power will wield it negatively to deny assistance when that's obviously the need of the hour. As Hera transmits the bad news to Ahsoka's ship, the Jedi enter the Danab system, which is the playground for evildoers in the galaxy. Soon, the transmission with Hera is disconnected as Huyang picks up bogies tailing them. Led by Shin Hattie, the apprentice of Balin Skull and Marek, a bunch of ships start firing at Ahsoka's ship. With the Jedi at the wheel and the droid put to work scanning the quickest way out, Sabine heads to the guns. She destroys a few bogies before Ahsoka calls her back to man the wheel as she heads outside. Standing on top of the ship in outer space with her lightsabers, Ahsoka slices an incoming attacker while Sabine has to fix the system. That's because right in front of Ahsoka's ship is the Eye of Shaun, a vessel being created by Morgan Elsbeth, who plans to use it as a transporter that can warp her to Thrawn's location. Ahsoka's ship is damaged by Morgan's attacks, and Huyang is taken out, but Sabine fixes the ship in the nick of time. The Jedi take the lead, and they enter the Cedo's planet atmosphere, with Shin, Marek, and the rest still in hot pursuit. To the amazement of the heroes as well as the audience watching at home, the ship suddenly encounters a group of Pergil, or the gigantic space whales that have been shown in the Mandalorian previously. However, Ahsoka and Sabine don't have much time to take in the magnanimity of these majestic creatures, as Shin is still firing at them. For the moment, Ahsoka dives into the clouds and escapes to seek refuge in the deep forests of Cedos, as Shin loses track of her targets because of the Purgils obstructing her view. She has to return dejected, but she makes sure to give Morgan a piece of her mind, passive-aggressively blaming her for failing to destroy the ship. Not one to take insults quietly, Morgan backhandedly chides Shin for losing track of Ahsoka. In the final scene, we find a massive group of hunters beginning a scouting operation of the forests in Cedos, with Balin Skull leading the operation. With him at the helm of the operation, Ahsoka and Sabine's ship might be discovered very soon unless the Jedi can come up with a plan at the earliest. After their ship is badly damaged in the pursuit by Shin Hattie, Ahsoka, and Sabine seek refuge in the forests of Cedos. The ship might not be in any condition to fly for a while and needs detailed repair, but with Balin's hunters closing in, the heroes may need to abandon the ship. Even so, they may not be able to go very far on foot because of the massive crew that Balin has organized. The only way Ahsoka and her Padawan can escape is if Hera brings her ship to their location to help them flee, but with the communications destroyed, whether Hera is aware of their current location or not is put into question. However, Ahsoka Episode 3 shows the growing bond between the Master and her trainee as Ahsoka starts trusting Sabine more than before. Only by having faith in Sabine can Ahsoka expect her Padawan to reach her fullest potential. By trusting her to fix the ship while the Jedi went out into space, Ahsoka let Sabine know that she believed in her abilities. Hopefully, the two can be as strong a team as Balin and Shin in the coming episode. The fourth episode opens with Ahsoka, Sabine, and Huyang fast at work as they try to fix their ship to the point that it can escape the forests of Cedos. However, trouble is looming nearby, as unbeknownst to the three of them, a scout spots the ship, as well as Huyang, who is the only one outside the ship. When reported to Balin Skull, he sends hunters to attack the Jedi and her team, while Morgan Elsbeth charts a path to locate Admiral Thrawn. There's help on the way, however, for Ahsoka, as she's been able to contact Hera Syndulla and a few other New Republic pilots, including the genial Carson Teva. With the ships heading toward Cedos, all that's needed is for Ahsoka and Sabine to sit tight until Hera can bring in the cavalry, 
but the hunters are faster. When the power inside the ship suddenly goes off, Sabine thinks it's Huyang being careless, but Ahsoka immediately knows something is up. Ahsoka sprints outside, followed by Sabine in Mandalorian gear, to find Huyang being attacked by a hunter. The master and apprentice make quick work of the small fry near the ship before heading off to find any more of the attackers. Huyang calls out to them, pleading with the women to stick together because that's when they're at their strongest. Soon, a real threat makes itself known, as the two women are faced by Shin Hattie in the Inquisitor, whom they had fought in Episode 2. As Ahsoka takes on the Inquisitor, Sabine decides to settle the old score with Shin. Meanwhile, Morgan is charting the path to Thrawn's location and has commanded her driver droid to warm up the Eye of Scion so that they can jump into hyperspace. The fight between Ahsoka and the Inquisitor is visually amazing, with the red and white lightsabers clashing repeatedly, leaving a streak of dizzying colors. In the end, her experience and mastery over the Force came into play, and Ahsoka managed to slice the villain's body, making it collapse into the ground. Sabine pleads with her master to head to the location where Morgan is firing up the ship to stop them from fleeing, while promising to take care of Shin. With Ahsoka going off, the two trainees begin fighting, although Shin's skills with the lightsaber render Sabine unarmed, and she needs to fall back on her Mandalorian weapons to counter. However, that's not enough to keep Shin down, and she manages to knock out Sabine once more before heading to where her master is. At the prime location, the ship is almost ready to take off, with the map finishing the final charting to Thrawn's location, when Ahsoka runs in and throws the map away, thereby singing her hand. Balin Skull understands his duty to defeat the Jedi so that they can achieve the greater good, even though it'd mean launching a war. Being a veteran of many battles, Balin knew he couldn't take Ahsoka lightly, and the two started fighting. She started gaining on him until Shin arrived, making the Jedi think her apprentice didn't make it. Using the Force to knock Shin out, Ahsoka delayed for too long, leading to Balin throwing her off the cliffs, leaving her fate unknown. Soon afterward, Sabine returned and held the map in her hand, determined to blast it to bits. It came down to Balin to convince the Mandalorian to not only hand over the map but also come with them willingly to Thrawn's location. Balin appealed to Sabine to think of her friend, Ezra Bridger, and that he'd be able to take her to him because he'd given her his word. He added that, unlike her previous master, he aimed to keep it. With his reassuring voice and the face of an old soldier who was too jaded to lie, Sabine gingerly handed the map to Balin, and he immediately placed it in the stand to restart its charting. Shin had come to her senses and started choking Sabine, but her master asked her to let go because he promised to take her with them. With the charting complete, it was time for the Eye of Scion to take flight. By that time, Hera and her team had spotted Morgan's ship, but before they could approach it, the Scion jumped into hyperspace, and the resulting pressure led to two of Hera's teammates crashing down. Sabine had been taken captive into the Scion as a prisoner, but she knew that had it been anyone else but Balin, she'd be long dead by now. Ahsoka came to, but she wasn't in the waters below the cliff from where she'd been thrown. Instead, she found herself on a translucent pathway that seemed to go on for all eternity and heard a familiar voice. Standing before Ahsoka was her master, the Jedi who made her into the fighter she'd become. It was none other than Anakin Skywalker, aka Darth Vader, who looked as young as he had before he'd turned to the dark side. The question that's now on everyone's mind is whether Ahsoka died and went into the nether realm, which is why she can see her master. However, this is just the world between worlds, and even living beings can come into this place, as per Star Wars lore. What we don't know is how Ahsoka got into this world, where she met her master, and what she will need to do to escape this place. In any case, she's very much alive, and we can thank Balin for that. Had he wanted, he could have run his lightsaber through Ahsoka's guts and killed her instantly. But being a Jedi veteran, he knew the value of keeping someone alive who knew how to use the Force, and he could be responsible for where Ahsoka has ended up at the moment. The fourth episode ends with Ahsoka reuniting with Anakin Skywalker, and this is their first meeting after he fought her at Star Wars, Rebels. In this world, he doesn't seem to possess any of the evil that Darth Vader was about and instead looks like the fresh-faced young Jedi he once was. One thing that many might question is why Sabine decided to go with Balin. Earlier in the episode, Ahsoka had suggested a possibility where they might abandon the search for Ezra if it meant stopping Morgan from reaching Thrawn. Sabine hadn't liked the idea one bit but couldn't retort against her master, so when Balin offered her a chance to meet her brother, she hesitantly accepted. While her heart was worried for her master, the need to see her brother was stronger, so she went with Balin and his people. However, whether Sabine comes to her senses and realizes that Morgan, Shin, and the other New Empire loyalists are pure evil or she stays with them for good, only the next episodes will tell.
The fifth episode witnesses Hera and her son Jason descend from her ship, the Ghost, onto the raised island where the previous week's fighting took place. As the mother-son duo looked around, Hera was alerted to someone's presence but was quickly reassured to learn it was just Hu Yang mourning the apparent deaths of Ahsoka and her Padawan, Sabine. As Hera and Carson Teva start looking for the women on the island, Jason stands near the edge of the island and calls his mother to tell her about the whispers he's hearing from the ocean. Initially refuting the kid's comments, when Hera does listen intently, she can indeed hear the sound of lightsabers coming from the sea. She quickly instructs Teva to take their ships and start scanning the sea for any sign of Ahsoka or Sabine. Ahsoka opens her eyes and finds herself in the world between worlds. As soon as she wakes up, she is greeted as Snip, the name her master used to call her, and sure enough, she finds Anakin Darth Vader Skywalker standing right in front of her. Anakin challenges her to a duel because her training is apparently not complete, and he manages to goad her into fighting him with the simple reminder that she lost a battle. The Master and the Padawan battle with their lightsabers until Anakin slashes the ground beneath him, and Ahsoka falls into a memory of her past. She's now the child she was during the animated series, Clone Wars, and she witnesses so much death and destruction around her. With dying and critically injured stormtroopers and Mandalorians all around her, Ahsoka is disillusioned with war and the purpose of all that the two sides in the galaxy fight about. The Siege of Mandalore plays out in front of her, and she starts wondering if their lives matter more than just being tools for fighting and winning wars. She watches the back of Anakin as he charges into the fight, with her master's shape morphing into that of Vader. As the fight continues, Ahsoka requests to be done with all this chaos, and her master attacks her, his eyes now reddish from the Sith power. What follows isn't a friendly duel between a master and his Padawan but between two opposing sides, as the Sith Vader charges blindly at the Jedi Ahsoka. However, the student of Anakin doesn't lose her mind in this situation and manages to place her lightsaber inches away from her master's throat as Vader's glowing eyes slowly recede into the blue of Anakin. The Padawan says it's her choice to continue living and not accept the fact that she died in the battle against Balin Skull in the previous episode. This brings her journey in the world between worlds to an end, and she's pushed out, which causes her limp body to descend into the dark waters around her. Thankfully, Jason had alerted his mother to look closer to the surface of the water, and Hera spots the presence of life just as Ahsoka is thrown out of the world in between. Ahsoka's body is fished out by a crew member of Hera, and she spends one rotation recuperating from the impact. When she wakes up, she heads outside to find Hera trying to make sense of the map that Balin had severed before leaving for Admiral Thrawn's location. Taking it in her hand, Ahsoka can sense the memories the map holds and understand that Sabine had gone with Balin and Shin willingly because, in her mind, reuniting with and retrieving Ezra Bridger mattered more than anything else. However, with the only direction guide sliced in half, there was no way to chart the path that Morgan Elsbeth's Eye of Scion had taken. So how would Ahsoka rescue her Padawan? Meanwhile, the New Republic Senate demanded that Hera return along with Carson and all the other pilots she'd taken to rescue Ahsoka because it was an unauthorized mission. However, Carson was able to come up with a story that kept the Republic occupied for a bit as Ahsoka looked for a way to go after Sabine. All she had to do was look up, and she spotted the massive space whales, aka Pergils, floating through the sky. In an unconventional plan, Ahsoka and the others flew to the sky and started going in the opposite direction of the Pergils until they came across a rather massive example of their species. Ahsoka stood on the wing of her ship and used the force to make the Pergil open its mouth so that Ahsoka's ship could safely nest inside as the whales warped into hyperspace. The Pergils have especially adapted creatures with the ability to jump into hyperspace, which is why Ahsoka chose one of these unique creatures. Even though the destination of the whales was unknown, at least they'd be going somewhere instead of being stranded in the forests of Cedos. With Hera and Carson wishing them luck, Ahsoka and Huyang hitched a ride inside the mouth of a Pergil into an unknown location, to be revealed in the next episode. The sixth episode opens with Ahsoka and Huyang comfortably sitting in their ship while a giant Pergil whale glides through space to take them to a new destiny. Ahsoka shares with Huyang something she'd kept secret while conversing with Hera, she says that in her vision, Ahsoka saw Sabine go off with Balin willingly. She regrets that she didn't have enough time to train Sabine to be more decisive, but Huyang comforts her. On a happier note, he agrees to tell his co-passenger a story that any Star Wars fan will instantly recognize because it's the story of a galaxy, far, far, away. Incidentally, 
This episode has the least amount of time dedicated to Ahsoka in the entire series, and the latter half of the episode is dominated by her Padawan. Inside Morgan Elsbeth's Eye of Scion, Balin Skull peers into the handcuffed Sabine Wren as she growls and complains that they had a deal. Balin walks away to unite with Morgan, but he doesn't seem too keen to eliminate Sabine. As the Scion arrives at its destination, we get to see countless massive skeletons as Morgan provides the exposition that this is the planet of Peridea, where Purgils come to end their lives. Hence, we're made aware that this is where Ahsoka's ship is headed, as the giant space whale she's hitching a ride inside is traveling to Peridea. Before long, the Scion descends on the vast wasteland of a planet, and we're introduced to the Night Sisters, three witches in dark red garb who are furious that an uninvited Jedi named Sabine has been brought along. The witches use their magic to bind Sabine and throw her into a cell, as the others await the arrival of the Grand Admiral. In a brilliant show of strength, Grand Admiral Thrawn arrives with a massive fleet of night troopers, a seemingly more elite version of the regular stormtroopers. Thrawn is greeted by Morgan, but he too is dissatisfied to see Sabine in their midst. However, unlike Morgan, Thrawn decides to play along with Sabine's quest to find her long-lost friend Ezra and asks his captain, Enoch, to help her. The leader of the troop with a gold mask takes Sabine to a chamber, returns her weapons and rations, and also gives her a ride, called a Howler. It's a large hyena-like creature that's capable of traveling long distances. However, Enoch warns Sabine of the raiders and the bandits that patrol the wasteland as Sabine takes off in search of Ezra. Meanwhile, Thrawn alerts Balin and his apprentice to secretly pursue Sabine until she reunites with Ezra, and then to eliminate them both. Not long after beginning her journey, Sabine is surrounded by bandits in red garb, who seem closer to Heian era samurais, and her ride flees in fear, leaving her to fend off for herself. After being pushed behind a rock, Sabine unleashes her lightsaber and quickly kills most of the bandits, while one runs away. Later, the Howler returns, but Sabine chastises it for abandoning her. However, being unable to refuse its puppy-like squeals, Sabine agrees to take the creature along, and it leads her to a strange-looking rock. Upon closer inspection, the rock pops up into a snail-like creature standing on two feet, and it's a Nodi, a native of Peridea. What's more surprising about the creature, though, is the rebel sign that it wears on its body, and it also recognizes a similar mark on Sabine's shoulder guard. She requests the Nodi to take her to the person who gave it the symbol, and soon, the entire area is filled with Nodis, who were, until now, pretending to be rocks, and they're deep in discussion. When they finally arrive at a conclusion, they decide to take Sabine somewhere. Tracking Sabine's path, Balin investigates the dead bandits and realizes they're on the right track. Shin asks him if he misses being a Jedi, and he agrees that he misses being a part of something, but not the weakness the Order brought. He then warns her that this planet is a land of ancient magic, and he doesn't plan on being trapped in her for long. However, his employer Morgan has been alerted by then that a ship is arriving on the planet inside a space whale, and upon learning of the same, Thrawn is displeased, but he doesn't recall who Ahsoka is. He demands to be made aware of every detail about her life now that she's proven to have survived a fatal blow from Balin. This further pollutes Thrawn's mind against Balin because he too belongs to the same Jedi Order that Ahsoka is a part of. He commands Morgan to destroy any oncoming space whale without mercy and then requests the Night Sisters to help him with their magic, and the sisters happily comply. Sabine arrives in the dwelling place of the Nadis, and she's pleased to find the creatures living in a healthy, civilized manner. They've got food cooking in an oven, and they even offer her some, while a baby Nodi peers at her curiously from a makeshift hammock. Sabine walks among the Nodis that are going about their day, and she stands at the center, looking around, until she's greeted by the purpose of her journey, Ezra Bridger. Unlike conventional reunions, there's no sprint for hugs or teary-eyed gushing, it's just two friends or siblings meeting after a long time as if they'd barely been apart. Ezra is excited to leave for home and asks Sabine about how she finally made it to the planet of Peridea, but she's unable to divulge everything yet. But the way things are going, it seems that Ezra will find out for himself the troubles that Sabine has gone through to reunite with him. Sabine Wren finally meets her long-lost rebel partner, Ezra Bridger, on the planet Peridea, living among the native Nadis. This hasn't been an easy journey, and she'd have to endure enormous hardships and hurdles to get to where she is. However, the troubles haven't ended yet, and Thrawn plans to eliminate both her and Ezra, he has even sent Balin and his apprentice to finish the job. The question on everyone's minds right now is, 
will Balin be able to bring himself to kill Sabine because, by now, we've realized he's not as cold-blooded and heartless as Thrawn or any usual Sith Lord. Therefore, Balin's loyalty, which is already being questioned by Thrawn, might come under further suspicion if he hesitates to eliminate Sabine. But how his apprentice will take action against her master remains to be seen. In any case, the penultimate episode coming out next week will reveal what happens when Ahsoka arrives on the planet per idea. Will she come face to face with Thrawn, or will Morgan's arsenal prove supreme? Ahsoka's penultimate episode opens with Ahsoka training with her lightsaber as a hologram of her master, Anakin Skywalker, who gives her important tips. Huyan comes in, and she temporarily pauses her training to announce that Anakin has left her 20 holograms, and it's evident that the recent encounter with her master in the world between worlds has impacted her. The droid informs her that the Purgils, the space whales Ahsoka and Huyang have hitched a ride with, are almost at their destination. Soon after, a series of explosions and rumblings alert them that something is very wrong, and they blast out of their carrier Purgil to find out they're amidst a minefield, set up by Thrawn's soldiers. As they start escaping the minefield, the scene cuts to the New Republic, where Hera Syndulla awaits trial. Having led a mission into an unknown galaxy, Hera is standing before the Senate as Senator Ziorno chews her out for going away on her own. It seems he's hellbent on proving Hera a threat while simultaneously refusing to believe that Grand Admiral Thrawn has returned. Hera's rescue comes in the form of C-3P0, who informs the Senate that Hera's leave had been sanctioned by Senator Organa and that she was well within her rights. This convinces Chancellor Mon Mothma that there's no other reason to hound Hera, although she pulls her aside and questions how big the threat of Thrawn is. Hera alerts her that they need to prepare for the worst because Thrawn's threat is very real. Meanwhile, Thrawn learns about Ahsoka's details and is struck curious when he finds out her master was Anakin Skywalker, and it also doesn't escape him that it was the same Jedi who joined the dark side. He knows that Ahsoka's main goal now that she's out of the minefield will be to look for Sabine, which is why she's made the journey, so he asks the Dark Sisters to locate both women for the final blow. In the deserts of Peridea, a herd of Nadis is traveling in their floating caravans, as Ezra and Sabine share one and recount tales. Ezra is pleasantly surprised to know everything that has happened since he fell out of contact and is amused to find that Sabine has found a mentor in Ahsoka. This happy reunion is paused when Sabine is contacted by Ahsoka through the Force, and the moment a connection is established between the two, the sisters triangulate Ahsoka's location. Thrawn sends his fighter planes after her, and a battle ensues. Ahsoka's ship begins swerving through the attackers that are chasing her as they near the area where Ezra and Sabine are trapped. Huyang advises against Ahsoka jumping in to join the fight because it can be very dangerous for her, but she asks him to be optimistic as she leaps out. Away in the distance, Balin Skoll and his men Shin Hattie have been watching the Nadis moving, and Shin has alerted Thrawn of Sabine's location as well, and more night troopers fly in. However, Balin doesn't join his trainee in the fight any longer because he says she's rather ambitious, and his path doesn't align with hers. Before leaving, though, he does warn that blindly chasing victory can get one killed. Soon, Shin is off to battle as Balin is left to witness from afar, until Ahsoka's crash landing brings him out of his reverie. He lets her know that he can't let her pass through, and the two Jedi exchange clashes with their weapons until Ahsoka thinks of a distraction. Using the lasers from the ships flying above, Ahsoka escapes, but Balin doesn't chase her. This shows that his heart isn't fully in the fight. After fighting off the raiders that Balin and Shin had led to Ezra and Sabine, the rebel siblings face a new threat in the form of night troopers. They surround them from everywhere, with Shin at the forefront. Ezra offers to talk it out as Shin declares an attack, just when Ahsoka rolls into the scene, and it's a war zone. With Sabine using the lightsaber she'd received from Ezra and her former colleague relying on his force, they take down much of the night troopers, while Ahsoka fights Shin, but now with an increased sense of confidence. Realizing that the fight is fruitless, Thrawn calls back his planes, and night troopers, and the Jedi watch as the soldiers retreat. Watching Shin panic without her master and stuck in the middle with enemies, Ahsoka offers a helping hand and wants to accept her. However, Shin escapes quickly, and it's made certain that without her master, she's not yet ready to take on all the challenges. Morgan Elsbeth feels that Ahsoka rejoining the fight and the need to recall the troops are a shame for Thrawn's army, but he's pleased with the outcome. The fight that ensued between the two parties offered his crew enough time to transport the cargo that he needed to get off per idea before he could leave. 
Thus, Ahsoka's attack on his forces came at the perfect time, and while she was distracted, he was now ready to leave this wasteland behind. He lets Morgan know that he possesses one thing on his side that Ahsoka lost fighting his soldiers, time. Now they can abandon her idea and go to a better place, while the Jedi remain stranded. However, we can see a happy reunion between Ahsoka, Ezra, and Sabine, and she greets them as friends. Ezra is ecstatic to know that he can finally go home and bids farewell to the Nadis as they prepare to leave. At long last, the transfer of cargo from the planet of Peridea to the ship Chimera is finally complete, and Morgan Elsbeth arrives to inform her master, Grand Admiral Thrawn, as much. He orders Captain Enoch to send in TIE fighters to destroy the ship of the Jedi, and like clockwork, two fighters head in Ahsoka, Sabine, and Ezra's direction. Meanwhile, inside the ship, Ezra is fidgeting with a tool, trying to fashion it into a working lightsaber, as Huyang continues to object to his process. Apparently, Canon Jarrus, the pupil of Huyang, had taught Ezra, so he'd do better to heed the advice of Professor Droid. In the end, Huyang hands Ezra a particular piece of equipment that helps him complete the lightsaber, and it reveals a spark of blinding blue. Sabine meets Ahsoka outside, and the Master and Padawan get to talking. The apprentice apologizes to Ahsoka for following her heart and going away with Balin's skull, but Ahsoka quickly forgives the young Mandalorian turned Jedi. She knows that she'd been Sabine's age once, and she promises to keep her vow as a master and support her through thick and thin, just as Anakin had supported her. The conversation is broken up as two TIE fighters zoom past the ship and the Nodi moving houses, and Ahsoka's ship takes continuous damage. Realizing they can't shoot down the fighters with their current weaponry, Sabine launches the ship into the fighters, and they shatter like straw houses. However, Ahsoka's ship has taken a beating as well, and they need to repair it before it can fly anywhere. Leaving Huyang and the Nadis to repair their ship, Ahsoka, Sabine, and Ezra head towards Thrawn's HQ atop two howlers. Morgan has proven herself to be quite loyal to Thrawn and the Night Sisters of Peridea, so it's time to reward her actions. The three sisters join hands and start chanting a spell, which gives Morgan the same blackish face tattoos and darkened pupils as the sisters, making her one of the Night Sisters. Moreover, they join hands to produce the Blade of Talzin, which exudes green embers. Now, Morgan is ready to take down any foe that might stand in her way. With the Jedi charging towards Thrawn, he commands his pilot to fire at them from the ship because he knows it's futile to argue with the Jedi that Darth Vader trained. The heroes dodge the raining hellfire and use the force together to pry open the massive gates to Thrawn's palace, making their way inside. The trouble isn't over, however, as a horde of night troopers rushes towards the three Jedi, now brandishing lightsabers. With a plethora of slashes and blaster shots thanks to Sabine, all the troopers are cut down and killed. But with their backs turned to the army of Thrawn, the Jedi don't realize that the trooper corpses are brought back to zombified life by the magic of the Night Sisters. Again and again, the Jedi kill the corpses, and repeatedly, they return to attack as an army of the undead. With Ahsoka engaged with the undead troopers, Ezra and Sabine take on two super troopers, but they prove more difficult to defeat than the usual cannon fodder troopers. With Sabine almost on the verge of being strangled and her saber flung out of her reach, she finally masters the force and uses it to stab it into her attacker's throat, while Ezra decapitates his opponent. They start running towards Thrawn's ship, which has by now taken flight, and there's an enormous chasm between themselves and the Chimera, but Sabine asks Ezra to trust her. He takes a leap of faith, and using her force, she helps him up Thrawn's ship. However, when it's her turn to jump, she realizes there's something she needs to do before. Ahsoka has been fighting with Morgan until now, and with her new Night Sister powers, she proves to be a formidable opponent for Ahsoka. With rapid exchanges of the sabers and the blade, the Jedi loses one of her sabers, but in a last-ditch attempt, she manages to cut Morgan across her stomach, killing her. Thrawn learns of his followers' death and just comments that she's fulfilled her part in the story. With the zombie troopers now surrounding Ahsoka to take her down, she's aided by her Padawan Sabine, who helps her fight off the undead, until Thrawn's ship starts firing at the building they're fighting in. With the building on the verge of collapse, the Master and her Padawan jump off the wing of Ahsoka's ship as they race to catch up with the Chimera. With a little distance between the two ships, Thrawn makes the jump into hyperspace, as Ahsoka's ship is heavily impacted by the blowback. On the planet per idea, Ahsoka and Sabine live amidst the Nodi settlement, and they're busy fixing their badly damaged ship as Sabine wonders whether Ezra went home safely. 
Ahsoka assures her that he has definitely found his way home. We see a brief scene of Shin Hattie walking up to the Red Bandits and raising her saber to find her way into their tribe. Her master, Balin Skull, stands all alone on a carved rock, overlooking a vast expanse, and his fate remains unknown. Meanwhile, a New Republic ship receives a small Empire ship, and out comes a night trooper. As Hera Sindulla and the others raise their blasters at this sudden arrival, the trooper takes his helmet off, and underneath the uniform is Ezra Bridger, showing that he's managed to find his way home. Sabine had completed her duty, although she didn't know it yet. Ahsoka stares into the void, and what she doesn't notice is that the spirit of her master, Anakin Skywalker, is studying her, waiting to see her next move. Thus, the first season of Ahsoka ends with Grand Admiral Thrawn escaping and Morgan Elsbeth's death. However, the death of Morgan seems very rushed, and there isn't enough character building for this devoted follower of Thrawn to make her death seem very impactful. There needed to be more of a backstory to this character, and once again, it showcases how Star Wars in the later years relied more on fancy and colorful lightsaber battles than actual stories. Be that as it may, the first season ends with Ezra Bridger managing to go home and meet with his old crew from Rebels, which was what Sabine had set out to achieve from the beginning. However, she and her master Ahsoka stay stranded on Peridea for the time being, so we need to wait and see how they can go after Thrawn in Ahsoka Season 2. Thank you for joining us on this journey, and I hope you enjoyed the episodes of Ahsoka.